here, but let me go to um, um, uh, my uh, presentation here, if I may. All right, you're able to see my slides here? Yes, we can see, Professor. Um, that's great, thank you. Um, and so, um, uh, first of all, uh, from an embryological perspective, this is a highly complex area, as you can see here. Uh, we have um, uh, the notochord uh, uh, forming there, the neural tube, uh, uh, this uh, area where the uh, rectum and the urogenital system come together. So we have the postanal gut uh, uh, embryologically, uh, proctidium, uh, uh, allantois, and uh, hindgut, everything sort of comes together. What that really means that there's an opportunity for uh, many things to go wrong here. And as a result of that, we tend to see a lot of uh, tumors in this region. Um, and uh, let's see if we can advance that. Uh, there we go. Um, so from an, uh, as far as the tumors that we see or the growths that we see in this area, you can see as if uh, the tumor is originating from motocore, typically that would be a chordoma, neural tube will give rise to pendomomas. Surface ectoderm is uh, the origin for dermoid cyst and the endoderm is for a bunch of uh, endo enteric cysts that we see in this area. Hansen's node uh, is the uh, origin of the teratomas and postanal guts uh, is the embryological structure uh, for postanal gut cysts we occasionally see in this region. Uh, not chordoma is the most common malignant tumor that we see uh, in the sacrum. Uh, so um, I'm going to be practical, and this talk is primarily directed at surgeons. And so uh, it's very critical to do a biopsy prior to the surgical procedure. And uh, I cannot overemphasize this. Uh, uh, you know, the, regardless of how typical the imaging studies look and how confident you are of the bio, uh, diagnosis, it's very important to do a biopsy. I have seen lymphomas mimic uh, uh, large chordomas. Obviously, many of those can be treated with uh, uh, radiation or uh, chemotherapy. Um, I've seen tumors uh, in this area where the biopsy was not recommended uh, because of potential risk of contamination, but massive surgical procedures were potentially entertained. And so biopsy is very important. It's uh, important to plan it through the transsacral route and at all costs avoid uh, the transrectal biopsy, which is commonly done for uh, prostate cancer and other conditions. Now, um, here's an example. This is the 21 year old uh, uh, young boy that I saw was referred to me from the West Coast uh, in the US uh, from a very well established academic center. Uh, this patient was told that he had a chordoma. Uh, the patient's mother asked whether or not the biopsy should be performed. Uh, she was told that uh, because of the risk of contamination, we would not recommend that, uh, but they recommended a, a total secrectomy with lumbar pelvic fixation and fusion, 21-year-old. So, uh, you know, a lot of features of this uh, can may, may very well look like a chordoma, but I was not 100% convinced. First of all, the age doesn't quite fit. And number two is you can see the epicenter of the tumor is mostly in the spinal canal here. So we went ahead and did a CT guided biopsy of this. This came up like that. And this is a really a typical mixed papillary pandemoma. Um, this patient uh, underwent a, a dorsal approach, gross total excision of this tumor. And so secondly, he received the radiation therapy. Uh, this patient is almost 15 years out from this surgical procedure with no evidence of recurrence and perfectly normal as far as the bowel and bladder function is concerned. As you can see, here's a case where that looks like a chordoma, but clearly it's not. And uh, that made a big difference in the overall outcome of this uh, young boy. Um, a lot of things that also look like tumor may not be tumors. Here's an example where you can see the partial, um, uh, uh, partially formed sacrum, uh, sacral genesis uh, distally. And this is a T1 weighted image on the left and T2 weighted image on the right. It's a very old slide, but you can see signal characteristics are consistent with CSF. And so this is a large pseudomeningocell, sacral pseudomeningocell, uh, uh, as a result of uh, uh, incomplete form uh, sacral, so called similar sacral. And so this is uh, not really addressed with any type of surgical procedure from the front. You typically approach this from the back and 
find this communication, we try to disconnect it and aspirate to flow it. This is a pathology, majority of the OBGYN physicians encounter during the delivery of a uh, child, and they sometimes take a biopsy of this, and they can get intractable CSF leak and you know, low pressure headaches and other complications. That's usually typically how uh, we get referred to these cases. Here's another one, very large tumor um, involving uh, very little of the sacrum, but mostly in front of it. Uh, signal characteristics of this tumor is consistent with a fatty tissue. And um, despite this very large size of the tumor uh, filling the pelvis, we did a small distal sacral amputation and entered the tumor from here and emptied it. Um, and here are the signal uh, characteristics of this tumor. This was a large dermoid, which was completely resected to a distal coxygectomy. Uh, the point of this case is that sometimes very large presacral masses can be resected to a small dorsal opening if the tumor uh, can be removed in an intralesional fashion. A couple of word, uh, words about the biomechanics of this area from a simplistic perspective. Uh, the weight from the lumbar spine is transmitted through the sacrum, through the SI joints, uh, then down to the ilium and down to the hip joints bilaterally. So this is really a conduit across this area. And so if you're doing a sacral amputation, the question always comes up how much of the sacrum you can cut. And uh, at one point, the patient would require a lumbar pelvic fixation. So a lot of the strength of this area comes from the ligaments supporting this, sacroiliac joints and sacroiliac ligaments. There are two sets of ligaments here that are very critical to free up the sacrum uh, that are shown here, sacrospinous ligament and sacrotuberous ligament. And I think you have to sort of understand these ligaments because otherwise you cannot really extract the sacrum uh, from a dorsal approach. The other thing you need to recognize is that the sacrospinous ligament sits ventral to the sacrotuberous ligament. And uh, the pudental nerve that we try to preserve in many cases, uh, if we are going to preserve the bowel and bladder function, is a nerve that travels between these two ligaments. And so it is uh, usually dorsal, the pudental nerve, the course of it is dorsal to the sacrospinous ligament and ventral to the sacrotuberous ligament. Uh, here's the dorsal view again. You can see the sacrospinous ligament here shown and sacrotuberous ligament, and these ligaments need to be cut. Otherwise, the distal portion of the sacrum would not be able to be taken out. Uh, this is the work of Gutenberg, uh, and this is a, um, a Swedish uh, uh, sur surgeon did this cadaveric study as a part of his PhD thesis, and you can see that the sacrum was progressively amputated. Um, what he found was that as long as at least uh, one centimeter of the sacrum uh, is left along with the sacroiliac joints on both sides. You don't really need to do a lumbar pelvic fixation with remaining sacrum is typically able to sustain uh, biomechanical uh, loads under physiological conditions. This is the dorsal view of the sacrum now with the muscles and the ligaments as well as the neural structures here. You can see the course of the sciatic nerve. You can see some of the critical vessels that sometimes give you trouble in the OR, superior gluteal outer artery here inferior gluteal artery here. Again, this is the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligament. That's the ligament where this pudental nerve, this nerve travels in between. And so sometimes you find a nerve proximally in the canal, you keep following it. Unless you recognize this, you may inadvertently cut the nerve while trying to cut the ligaments. Um, and you thought that you preserved the roots, but the patient is still bowel and bladder continent. That's probably the reason why most of the time that really happens. And also there are a bunch of other muscles that are directly attached to the sacrum, as you can see, for example, performers. And so all that uh, needs to be uh, detached in order to get the sacrum out of there. This is the ventral view of this area anatomically. There's a much more detailed picture showing the contributions to the prudental nerve. You can see the S2, S3, and S4 nerves are the major contributors to that. And they come together and form the prudental nerve, which then goes to the sphincter uh, uh, of the both rectum and bladder. This is a paper we published many years ago, uh, trying to describe uh, how various sacral tumors, and this is primarily chordomas, how they are situated and how they can be resected and what the neurological implications of that might be. 
Uh, we also demonstrated uh, uh, with this paper that tumors of the sacrum, if they are removed in a block fashion with negative margins, one can achieve a very nice uh, survival, recurrent uh -huh. species survival, whereas if the tumor is left behind, typically with additional recurrence of the patients die rel relatively quickly after that. So we make every effort to remove the tumors in an unblocked fashion. Based on the state of this was also later validated with our work with the AO Spine Tumor Knowledge Forum. Now, here are the locations of the tumor. This is our classification we proposed at the time, which is pretty much endorsed by everybody now. What we are trying to show here that one can um, uh, do a... Uh, osteotomy higher and yet preserve the nerve root uh, that is uh, traveling through that area that it exists the spine the column lower. And what I mean by that. So we, for example, this tumor you can see is involving the distal part of the sacrum. Um, uh, and uh, if you look at the nerve roots, S1, S2, and S3 nerve roots are all free here, um, uh, even including the uh, uh, it's four nerve root, and you can really cut the sacrum anywhere higher up here, and then just follow the nerve roots. In this instance, you can follow the S3 nerve roots, and everything else below can go. Uh, this patient will have an intact S1, S2, S3 uh, on both sides. If you have, you know, both sides intact in that fashion, the patient will have normal bowel bladder function. So this really sort of tells you what the patient's function is going to be like. If you come here. You can see that there's three nerves are involved in a tumor that's coming up to the mid sacral area. You can cut it a little higher, but you have to sacrifice S3s bilaterally. Typically, the patient would have pretty good sensation with the preservation of the two S2 nerves bilaterally, and yet would not necessarily have voluntary control. Uh, and then here, you can see the tumors coming even higher. The S2 nerves are involved bilaterally, so all the roots are going to be cut, so the patient will have no sensation, no control of the bowel or bladder function. And then finally, the tumors can be even higher. That involves the entire sacrum where you have to do a total sacrum with sacrifice of all the roots. Now you're cutting this one nerve on both sides, which are the contributors to the lower extremity of function and plantar, uh, plantar flexion. Uh, so the patients can actually walk quite well as, as long as you preserve the L45 trunk anteriorly, uh, but uh, they may not be able to do jump shots and things like that if you're playing basketball, for example. And if you, uh, and some, sometimes the tumors can be even higher that goes into the lumbar spine and you have to really resect a couple of the lumbar vertebra with it. If you were to do that, then the patient would not be able to walk because you're cutting the lumbar trunk along with the, all the sacral roots. This is how it looks like from the side. You can see a tumor that's low situated, mid sacral, high sacral, the amputation lines and how that would look like. Here are examples, the case examples. So this is a tumor you can see at sacrococcygeal cordoma. All of these are cordomas. Uh, so you can cut right here, S1, S2, S3, S4. You're preserving essentially everything. This patient would have normal and bowel and bladder function. If you come on over here, is you have to really cut somewhere at the mid S2 level, but you can preserve the S2 roots bilaterally. The patient would have you know good sensation and uh, some function, but not necessarily you know, voluntary function. If you come up here on the right, the tumor comes uh, higher up. So you have to cut somewhere below the S1 uh, vertebra and that will lead to sacrifice of the S2 nerve with bilaterally and the patient will have complete loss of bowel and bladder control. Now the tumors can also be situated eccentrically um, and uh, typically the ones that are over the SI joint are um, uh, chondrosarcomas. Uh, that's a typical location for that. Um, and the, that would require a combination of an internal hemipelvectomy and a, a hemisacrectomy procedure. However, if you preserve all the nerves on the contralateral side, the typical patients would typically have a normal bowel bladder function. They may also come in different shapes and sizes, a little bit lower caudally involved, mid, mid portion of the side joint, or sometimes all of it. Uh, the other thing to remember that um, although uh, you are approaching the tumors from posteriorly, by getting in front of a coccyx, you can uh, uh, mobilize the rectum and you can get your hand in front of the sacrum. And so you can get ventral uh, exposure from all dorsal approach. And you can make this amputation um, uh, while your fingers up here 
knowing exactly where uh, you're cutting through. Uh, this shows a side joint resection here. So um, a variety of approaches that we use for sacrum, the anterior approach, um, there are advantages in using this. One is uh, you can uh, mobilize the ventral vasculature, iliac vessels, when you're doing a high sacral amputation or total sacrectomy, that's important. You can mobilize the rectum. You can do a nice l 5 one discectomy if you're doing a total sacrectomy, which will be completed from the back. You can mobilize the L4-5 trunk and, uh, and also you can harvest my cutaneous rectus flap that can be tucked into the belly and pulled through the back to close the incision. I'll show you some examples of that. This is the posterior approach where uh, advantages of the posterior approach uh, is that you can see the sacral nerve roots very nicely. It's a good way to find them. You can do your sacral osteotomies uh, very precisely from the back. Uh, you can deliver the large specimen much more easily from the back than through the belly. And if the patient needs any type of uh, spinal lum uh, lumbar pelvic fixation, you can also do that at the same time. We'll look at some cases. This is the approach that I mentioned, the flow called the Kraske approach, where you can get ventral to the sacrum, dorsal to the rectum, and you can get your high hand, your high, hand very high up there uh, to be able to feel that. More recently, we have been using these 3D printed uh, models of the tumor, real models. This is a patient with a uh, Ewing sarcoma. We operated uh, on here a uh, year and a half, two years ago. And you can see we basically did a 3D printed model of the tumor. These are very helpful in the OR. So you can turn it around, look at it ventrally, dorsally. You can see where you need to cut the ileum, where you need to cut the sacrum, the joints, et cetera. We also have been using this in the OR now. This, we have an intraoperative CT scanner. So the patient typically um, and has a preoperative MRI scan. So we bring the patient to the OR, do an intraoperative CT. We map the patient's tumor on the MRI scan. We fuse it with the intraoperative CT image and we use image guided navigation in the OR. And we can be very precise, knowing exactly how far the tumor goes up, down, laterally, um, as we can do a more complete resection. Uh, a case example here, which are some, some unusual cases that I'm going to show you. This is a patient that I treated here maybe a couple of years ago. This patient presented to a, uh, a hospital up in Boston with um, uh, uh, urinary obstruction. So the patient had bilateral ureteral obstruction, actually, had bilateral nephrosis, hydronephrosis, and urgently underwent initially nephrostomies, and then they put ureter stents bilaterally. The patient got imaging studies, and you can see this mass here, very large mass. And this is here, see, that looks like here. And believe it or not, this is schwannoma that really achieved a sort of a giant size to the point where it obstructed the ureter bilaterally when the patient developed bilateral hydronephrosis. So we approached in two stages, first started from the back and excised this intraspinal component and did a lumbar pelvic fixation, given that the side joint was completely disconnected on one side. Uh, or ALA, shall I say, you can see the hole that the tumor created here, and then uh, came from the front and then resected the remainder of it. It was a very bloody tumor. We lost almost 23 units of blood when we were resecting the tumor from the front, but eventually the patient did very well. Uh, ureter stents were taken out eventually, and uh, the kidney function normalized. I just have a patient with an osteogenic sarcoma involving more than half of the sacrum, uh, some of the foramen on the contral outside is preserved. This shows the CT scan, the extent of the tumor there. That's how it looks like. And the actual images approached in two stages, first from the front, where we did some of the osteotomies. Um, and then you can see the, and then we came from the back uh, and then extracted the tumor with an internal hematolectomy and did the lumbar pelvic fixation and fusion. Here's a specimen that was removed which was an oxygen sarcoma with negative uh, margins. And we reconstructed this with a combination of a couple of things. We had a cadaveric pelvis that was actually put in here for the missing part of the ileum. And then we put this uh, femur shaft that went from one side to another. We put a, uh, you can see a screw across that, uh, trans, uh, sort of a sacral screw holding the femur shaft in place. Uh, this is another patient uh, who has a, a large, which turned out to be an osteoblastoma. I put this slide here because this was really the only one that we did where we started from the back. We were planning to do two stage procedure, but we kept going and going and going. We were able to resect this tumor all from posteriorly 
the total sequectomy and remove the uh, tumor. You can see a uh, very vascular nature of the tumor and how it came all the way up here. Um, and we did this all from posteriorly, but uh, I wouldn't advise that you do a total sequectomy from posteriorly. We had a lot of experience in doing it and we were able to stay out of trouble. You can see some of the blood vessels that we had to deal with uh, through a very small opening here. Iliac veins, for example, or at least for some of the branches were very problematic. But nevertheless, all the tumor came out from a one single dorsal approach. We published that later. And then reconstructed this area with bilateral EAC screws, Lomar, pelvic Lomar screws, and uh, a variety of connectors. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Here's the patient specimen that was removed in one piece here. Uh, this is a patient with a large chordoma, uh, and it's an engineer who presented with an enlarging mass in the buttock, had a CT guided biopsy of this, which proved to be a chordoma. We did a total sequectomy here. I think this shows all the stages of the uh, operation that we discussed and some of the advantages of uh, various approaches. And that's why I'm gonna show this case uh, with some uh, illustrations. Uh, the first stage was done from the front through a midline uh, laparotomy approach. We did a complete L5 response discectomy, uh, took some of the vessels in the front. And here's in the operating room, the patient's head is uh, on the left side, left top corner of the slide and the feet is on the right side. You, this is a complete L5 S1 discectomy. The internal EDX are taken here. Um, and then uh, we came from the back. This is lumbar region, and this is the iliac crest on the left and iliac crest on the right. And then we will do a laminectomy. As here, you'll find it as L5 nerve root. We're gonna follow it from here all the way down to the cytic notch. So we'll do the same on the contralateral side. But at the end of the case, here's our laminectomy at the L5 S1 level. We find the L5 nerve root. Eventually, you'll come find the L4 coming from above, and we connect this dot here to the sciatic notch and do an osteotomy right across here. Could be sometimes partially in the, through the side joint, uh, but we use the L5 nerve as a guide for this, as you can see how we can follow that. Everything medial can go, everything lateral you need to preserve. And here is how it would look like after the tumor is extracted and some of the sacral roots that are cut and some of the ligaments that are cut, as I talked to you, I, I mentioned earlier, the sacrospinous and sacral tuberous ligament. And that's exactly how it looks like in the OR. You can see this is the end plate of the L5 vertebrae. This is the L5 nerve root coming down here. And here's the other one. L4 root, I don't know if you can appreciate, it's coming right here. And this is the rectum here. And here's a specimen that's removed in one piece here. And here's the reconstruction of this area. So the general principles of reconstruction, first of all, we learned that given that uh, the removal of the sacrum completely dissociates the lumbar spine uh, from the pelvis, you can change the patient's PI completely. And so pelvic incidence can be readjusted. And so you have to really be very cognizant of where the pelvic incidence is gonna be. And so we now learn the hard way that we do all of these patients on Jackson table, we you know, get the maximum lumbar low doses and, uh, and then we determine what the patients have, three operative low doses and a sacroiliac a, a, a pelvic incidence is, and we try to reproduce that uh, in the operating room. Um, and so we wouldn't change that significantly because it has significant implications you can imagine regarding the size of balance of the patient. This is how it looks like in the or in other case, uh, in this case, the lumbar vertebrae had been removed, so we replaced it with a, a distractible cage here. Uh, but again, and as far as the reconstruction of this area is concerned, I view the pelvis as like the bottom of the Alpha, uh, Eiffel Tower, and then the spine is like the Eiffel Tower that's built on it, so your foundation needs to be large. So typically, we use bilateral iliac screws. Uh, you have to close the pelvic ring, so we have to create some sort of a rigid bridge across we need to put bone, so we have, an, you can see a tibial shaft uh, bridging the gap here, and we have a bunch of DVXs put up there. Um, and then the closure of this area, very important. I mentioned earlier that anterior operation allows you to have the opportunity to harvest the myocutaneous rectus flap. This is a pull-through flap. This is a vascularized flap. The inferior epigastric vessels are preserved. The spare ones are cut. And it, uh, this, the, this is harvested, including skin subcutaneous tissue, muscle, and tucked into the belly. Here's the, in the OR, this is being harvested. It's a, a pretty large flap, skin, myocutaneous tissue, muscle. It's 
dropped into the belly and then it's pulled through the back. And here's the patient that had that kind of flat closure and that's how it looks like. This used to be the patient's belly. Here's a gluteal crest here. Um, and this has been you know, used to close the defect. And this is highly useful in patients who undergo total sacrectomies uh, since we're gonna have a very large defect to fill there. So I'm gonna summarize for what we sort of discussed here so far. Uh, I would say that it's critical to know the histology of the tumor before planning any type, type of sacral amputation. I've shown you the example of the mixed repetitive pandemoma case where the operation that we did, it was completely different than the patient was initially recommended based on the presumed diagnosis of a chordoma. Uh, if the tumor can be excised intralesionally, you can excise very large presacral masses through a small dorsal approach a small coccygectomy or distal sacral amputation can allow you to gain access to the mass and get into the capsule and to it and pull it out. Uh, as I mentioned, the anterior approach has a number of advantages. You can mobilize the ventral vasculature. You can do a complete uh, discectomy at the L5 S1 level if you have a, uh, a total sacrectomy. Uh, you, uh, you can put a myctinous rectus flap into the belly to be pulled from the back. However, and here is not really very good to find the nerve roots. Uh, and you cannot obviously do any type of reconstruction in here. And then as far as the posterior approach is concerned, uh, that's very good to identify the nerves, to do the osteotomies, to do a reconstruction. Um, and so depending upon the situation, you have to decide whether or not you need both, or uh, you can do this all from posteriorly. Most sacral tumors can be done from posteriorly, except for total sacrectomies and very, very high sacral amputations. And we also briefly talked about the complete resection of the sacroiliac joint, uh, which is typical for chondrosarcoma. Um, and uh, this would require sort of combining into an my pelvectomy and my sacrectomy. But it's important to recognize that if you keep every, all the nerves on the contralateral side, and the patient will be left with normal bowel, near normal bowel and bladder function. From a bowel bladder perspective, if you have two S2 nerve roots and one S3 nerve root preserved, uh, typically you would have good bowel bladder function. Um, so we make every effort to at least preserve two S2, one S3 nerve root in any case, if possible, uh, while respecting the oncological objective of the surgical procedure. So I would stop there and um, take uh, any questions that you might have. I believe I had only 30 minutes to talk here. Uh, thank you, Professor. It was an uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, can you uh, stop uh, sharing, please, Professor? Sure. Okay. Uh, firstly, I want to ask one question. Uh, uh, you are the uh, most uh, doing such as uh, surgery uh, in on posterior approach. Uh, what is the uh, rest restriction of posterior only approach uh, for you? Uh, well, limitation, you know, how far, where, where we, we are not able to do it, you're saying? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I don't like to do a total sacrectomy with an all posterior approach. Uh, if you look at the ventral aspect of the sacrum and its relationship to the big vessels, uh, internal iliac vessels and iliac veins, uh, that gets pretty close uh, uh, at the very high portion of the sacrum at the S1 level in front of the ILA bilaterally. Uh, if you drop below the S1, S2 level, it's relatively vascular. And so if you want to stay out of trouble uh, in terms of getting into big vessels uh, uh, from posteriorly, typically if the lesion is located below the S1, S2 level and your cut is going to be through the somewhere through S2 or at least right below the S1, S2 disc, uh, all of those tumors can potentially be done all from posterior. If it's higher up, then I think you are taking a risk. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, one question, uh, uh, did you prefer uh, the uh, embolization uh, before the surgery? So we don't do embolization for tumors uh, such as chordomas or chondrosarcomas. They are not really very vascular if you end up entering them. Uh, but uh, for a tumor like osteoblastoma, for example, that I've shown, we would do pre-op embolization 
We do pre-op embolization of all joint cell tumors, anosal bone cysts, uh, hemangiomas, uh, uh, but typically for chordomas, chondrosarcomas. Some of the osteogenic sarcomas can be very vascular, but we typically plan an operation that would be entirely extra lesional, and hence we don't necessarily do embolization. If we are going to be intralesional, which sometimes is the case, as you can imagine, with anosal bone cysts and giant cell tumors, we do pre-op embolization. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there is one question uh, from uh, Nur. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, your wonderful lecture, indeed. Uh, what's your kind of uh, regarding the role of protein therapy in sacral cordoma? Uh, ESP intensity modulated CT uh, compared uh, with high dose photon therapy and combination of proton and photon therapy. Yeah, so that's, these are excellent questions. And so uh, we typically use all of them uh, depending upon the circumstances. So if the tumor is relatively small and we have done a complete resection with negative margin and we are confident of our margins, we typically would not give any additional treatment. Um, if there's any question about the margins or the tumor is very large, in that situation, uh, we typically consider giving pro, uh, uh, post-operative proton beam radiation therapy. The proton beam tends to be our favorite uh, mode of radiation. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, we may end up using a combination of uh, proton and photons. Uh, we typically reserve the stereotactic radio surgery in sacral tumors, uh, for recurrence. Uh, so we may treat the initial tumor with proton beam radiation therapy if there's any residual tumor. And then we come back um, and treat if the tumor does come back uh, with serotactic radio surgery, a small portion of that. And as you know, also, some people are, are using carbon ion radiation as well. Uh, you have to be aware that many of the radiation uh, approaches, uh, if they are used before the surgery, can complicate the surgical procedure significantly, uh, particularly wound complications. Uh, uh, MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital, has a protocol where they typically give pre-op radiation, half of the pre-op dose of the proton beam before the surgery, the other half after the surgical procedure. Uh, and I've operated on a number of those patients, and we have very significant complications, both in terms of wound healing as well as some uh, issues related to adherence of the rectum to the ventral tumor capsule. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Rahmi Kemal Koch say thank you uh, for your good presentation. And Professor Uygur Er, thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. And Dr. Ramat uh, say thank you, sir, for this outstanding lecture. And uh, Professor Uygur Er, say, uh, ask you, uh, what is your cervical cordoma surgical strategy? What is my, I'm sorry, what is the question? What is my? Uh, what is your cervical cordoma uh, surgical strategy? The cervical cordomas are much more challenging, as you can imagine, uh, in many ways, from uh, compared to sacral cordomas. Uh, you have to deal with the uh, vertebral arteries, and you have to deal with the nerve roots, and um, so it really is very individualized. Uh, first of all, I think that you have to separate the upper cervical cordomas, like uh, the cordoma that involves the C1, C2, and clival region uh, from the lower uh, subaxial uh, cervical cordomas. Uh, so we look at every case very critically. Uh, and you look at the age of the patient, look at the uh, uh, topography of the tumor, uh, which nerve roots, which vessels are being involved. And not infrequently, cervical cordomas can involve both vertebral arteries, which obviously makes the M block resection uh, impossible. Um, and so uh, I would say we try to do an operation that is M block whenever possible, but we have to consider whether or not the nerve root sacrifice vertebral artery sacrifice, uh, uh, all of these things would be worth it, uh, given that sometimes it's very difficult to get an m block resection despite your best effort, since these tumors tend to uh, infiltrate along the longus coli, muscles up and down along the vertebral foramina, along the vertebral artery. So you have to look at the case very, very critically. Young patient, well, um, uh, sort of uh, 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 
a tumor that is favorable in terms of it is uh, topography, and you can sacrifice one vertebral artery and uh, maybe a functional uh, nerve root that is not so functional like C7 nerve root. In those cases, we would uh, try to do an unblock resection with both anterior and posterior reconstruction. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, there is one more question from uh, Professor Kemal Koç. Do you use any hemostatic agents such as flucine or transferenic acid? We love flucine. We've used uh, literally truckloads of them. And so uh, I think the flow seal really revolutionizes spine surgery in many ways because it takes care of the epidural venous bleeding and you can they operate much faster by doing so. Uh, but we do use flow seal extensively. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one question from uh, Professor Junaid Temit. Uh, thank you for this uh, good presentation, sir. Do you have uh, experience with Im Im imatinib uh, chemotherapy? Uh, do I have experience in what? I'm sorry. Imatinib. Imatinib. Uh, so, um, uh, so we do. Uh, we do. We typically try that. And, you know, as I would say a small percentage of the chordoma patients with recurrent chordomas can uh, respond to, uh, can respond to uh, uh, Gleevec, uh, Imatinib, uh, uh, very nicely. Um, and, um, you know, I have a one patient currently uh, from Greece who was on it and actually got a pretty good response. And so, uh, yes, uh, the short answer is yes, we try. It's our first line uh, chemotherapy to go to for recurrent cord uh, Thank you, Professor. Uh, one question from Dr. Kemal. Uh, thank you very much for this excellent lecture. My question is that sacral lesions are less but important part of uh, our practice. Especially for planning uh, of sacrosanct, do you use any cadaver or computer biomechanical model? Do we use cadaveric uh, substitute for what part of the sacrum? I'm sorry. Uh, I am asking uh, again. Uh, we say thank you very much for this excellent lecture. My question is: sacral lesions are less but important part of our practice. Especially for planning out of uh, sacrectomy, do you use any cadaver or computer biomechanical biomechanical models? Uh, so, the, the, as I've shown uh, on one of the slides, we do use three D printed models of the tumor. Uh, let me make you a good example. So, let me show you that. So, this is this is one of our tumors, for example, that we operated on. You can see the sacrum. Uh, you can see the, the tumor and we have the nerve roots so even highlighted there, you can see in yellow. Uh, and so we use this kind of 3D printed models to plan the surgical procedure. And we also use the preoperative MRI scan and do an intraoperative CT, fuse the two and use image guided navigation by mapping the tumor in the operating room. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, one question from Edwin Vasvi uh, from Varna. Uh, how do you manage metastatic cordoma in the spinal column? Do you go for radical surgery? If there are metastases outside the sacrum, what are the indications for vertebrectomy? And so if there is a metastasis to the spinal column and the tumor is confined to the vertebra and that is amenable to M block resection, we do an M block resection because that really achieves the best local control for that tumor. Uh, so let's say the patient is sick, cordoma that's resected, and we don't really have any residual there, but now presents with a L1 metastatic cordoma that is confined to that vertebra. We would consider doing an M-block resection. Uh, that, is, I believe, gives you the best opportunity to have local control. In some cases, if the tumor is confined to the vertebra, we may choose to treat it with surtex surgery to see what happens with it, but if the tumor is large, there's yeah, epidural involvement, uh, but if we can get the tumor out uh, uh, in an unblocked fashion, we would consider that, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, one question from Professor Yunus Aydin. Uh, he says, hi, Zia, it's really great pleasure for me to observe uh, again your great accomplishment after a long time. Uh, how many centers like yours in the US who, who has availability for such a complicated case? Uh, I mean, I have 
to train a number of outstanding fellows over the years, and they have now their own programs. Uh, I think the Anderson Cancer Center is an excellent place where there is this kind of expertise. Dr. Larry Ryans was my very first fellow. Um, Dr. Michelle Clark um, at Mayo Clinic, and we have Dr. Dean Chow at UCSF, and we have, uh, uh, let's see, it's, uh, Sloan Kettering now, who's was at NYU, and Dr. Ida Lawfer. Um, and so there are quite a few people around the country in the major academic centers where they were trained with us and had a lot of experience in doing sickle um, uh, tumors. Uh, so uh, they do uh, these types of procedures, similar procedures, shall I say, uh, and it, it's more of a commonplace now than it used to be when I was in training. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, from Dr. Iran Yilmaz, uh, he says, thank you for this uh, amazing presentation. And uh, I don't see any comments or uh, more questions. Uh, Professor Suju. Uh, I want to thank again to uh, Professor Gökastan for accepting our offer to speech a second time. It was an honor for us to have you again. Thank you so much. It was an yeah. amazing lecture. And it was an outstanding evening for us. Thank you. Uh, it was my pleasure. And thank you so much for the invitation. It's wonderful to see you all. And I very much look forward to uh, meeting with you in person, hopefully in Turkey. Yeah, me, me too. Uh, in Izmir. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.